Today we'll be hearing from uh, Mr. Eric Hersman. He's a technologist, a commentator, and an entrepreneur who specializes on the impact and the application of technology throughout Africa. We'll also be hearing from the Honorable Dr. Olivia Muchena, the Zimbabwe former Minister of Higher Education, Tertiary Education Science, and Technology Development. We'll also hear from Mr. Hopefully Toldros Tadesi, if we can get the technology to work, who's a noted social media thought leader in Ethiopia and on the continent. And our prayer is by the end, we'll be able to uh, hear from Apostle Opoko Oyina, uh, a well-respected Christian leader who served faithfully as a full-time minister of the Church of Pentecost for over 42 years, and also served as the formal general superintendent for the Church of Pentecost of Ghana. We'd also like to direct your attention to the website where you can find a more in-depth biographies of all of these noted leaders that we have gathered with us today. So as we begin today, again, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us on this webinar. 
Uh, please welcome Mr. Eric Persman. And as we mentioned briefly, he's a noted entrepreneur, technologist, advancing the use of technology in Africa. He's the CEO of Brick, which is a rugged wireless Wi-Fi device designed and engineered in Kenya for use throughout the numerous emerging markets. Uh, in 2010, he founded iHub, which is Nairobi's hub for a technology and community. He's also the co-founder of Ushadi, the free and open source software for crowdsourcing, as well as another a number of online communities promoting creative solutions and the entrepreneurial entrepreneurship and the development challenges across the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eric Hurston. Thank you, uh, Daryl and Martha for um, inviting me to, to speak today. And it's good to, I'm, I'm not even sure who's on the other side of that. That's the part of the webinar that you just don't know anymore. But thank you for everybody who's also here on this, uh, for this talk. Um, so yeah, I'd like to, um, say just a little bit more context is that um, while I'm, I'm very deep involved in the technology space here, and I'll get into some of what I've learned about that and how that's affecting uh, ourselves, you know, actually everybody across the continent. Um, I grew up here too. So I grew up in, in Sudan, South Sudan and North Sudan and then Kenya. My, uh, my father was, um, my parents were Wycliffe Bible translators. And um, so it gave me a you know, a background of, of growing up here before I went to the U.S. and then came back after my university degree to start my first businesses. Okay, so without any further ado, just because I have a little, I don't have too much time, I want to go into the, the presentation itself. Um, so can I bring up the first slide? So um, the company I run is called Brick. Uh, Brick is a, a company built on the foundations that we can design and develop our own solutions. So we've done that in software for a long time in Africa. Uh, in hardware, it's newer. And you know, the, it started from this question asking, why do we use hardware built for other parts of the world when the needs in our part of the world are very different? Uh, in the connectivity, we have power outages or we have um, the need to use SIM cards instead of Ethernet cables, things like that that caused us to develop a new device, a new piece of hardware that um, we ended up shipping all over the world to 50 plus countries. Uh, but in that process, we also figured out something else, which is if we don't have um, the right kind of solid level of connectivity, um, or if, if even if we have the right hardware, it doesn't matter if the people who need to get online can't get online. So really what I think about a lot is that we talk about everybody being in the 21st century, right? They're 20 years into the 21st century now across the world. This, this is the, all of us. Um, but we can't be a 21st century economy without power and without connectivity. Those are the two foundational elements that you need. And on top of those two foundational elements, everything else is built. So, um, so with that in mind, we actually changed our business model and we started instead of selling our hardware, we started to deploy it ourselves into public spaces. Uh, that means, you know, in the marketplaces, in the dukas, in the um, barber shops and youth centers, and creating a public Wi-Fi hotspot that anybody could connect to, and then creating a business model that allowed anybody who couldn't couldn't afford to pay to get onto it. So, but let's let's see why. Why is this important? All right, next slide. So, the, you know, when we look at the reasons why connectivity is important, why what I mean by a 21st century economy, we're already seeing an overburdened education system. Um, before before this, I also our company also did an education product that was made specifically for uh, primary school students. And so we are deep in the space around the content, around the teachers and what they needed, around administrators and what they needed, and of course about students. And what we saw was an overburdened system with not enough teachers, with not enough material, with books that would deteriorate in one to two years. And we realized there was a real need um, for the system to become more digitized in order to uh, deal with more students and to make sure that they had the right type of quality education no matter where they were in the country. So what, what we've seen, and, and I think what Daryl mentioned earlier, is that uh, technology is really an accelerant. Um, um, in a system, but a pandemic is an accelerant to that accelerant, right? And so what we see is the pandemic is forcing us all to take these things much more seriously. 
if you're if you're running an education system, I'm really looking forward to the next speaker on this. Um, is what happens when you have to move? You're forced as a country to move to providing school in a digital way because your students actually can't be there in person any longer. These are the kind of questions that countries need to answer. The second one is healthcare. Of course, you know, digital enables remote healthcare. Uh, telemedicine is all of a sudden something that's valuable, and people were kind of had the brakes on that uh, a lot more than they needed to. All of a sudden, with uh, the pandemic rolling in and the need for the digital response to this, uh, people are still sick. People still need to talk to doctors, and well, there's no better way to do that than to use a um, use the internet, some type of connectivity medium, so people can see what's going on and give at least some type of response on what's needed. And then finally, a part of that is digitized community health workers. So community health workers have been um, time and time again invaluable in responding to the normal mundane healthcare issues as well as pandemics. We've seen this from the Ebola response in West Africa to just everyday response of community health workers here. They need connectivity as well. Um, they need to have data, they need to have information, and they need to be able to upload that information as well. Um, so that's in the in the area of things that are just good for people. Um, commerce is another one, though. We've seen it completely disrupt supply chains. Or we've seen it completely change the way goods are sought, are, are, are bought and sold. And um, this this whole conver there's a really big long conversation around digitizing of, of small businesses in Africa. And now it's not only um, something that that people are speaking about, but the people who are running the businesses are saying they need to do this too. We deal a lot with small businesses here in, in Kenya, and it's been quite something to see how just a small little deviation in the way they sell their goods into a digital space can vastly increase their revenues in a time where things are very tough, and that little bit of revenue increase can be, can be significant. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was government services, and this is, this is where I'm, I'm probably the least impressed um, on, on the continent. Um, we have a lot of governments who have been pushing for digital services, which is which is, is what we need. So that's a good thing. Um, but they haven't been putting equal amount of energy into making sure that everybody in the society has access to that same signal. And uh, and so if you need to get your license uh, and you can only do that by going online to a website, yet you don't have access to either a device or the or you can't pay for the Internet then then you have a problem and it's only becoming worse now uh, with with less disposable income um, as people find the economy is worsening uh, that is is becoming a, a bigger problem for both them and the government to solve for all right next slide um, and then finally i think this is where there's a lot of maybe a uh, chance for some conversation here is it specifically around this is where do you, where do we do where do we go for for church now where is the learning happening where's the community happening and um you know a lot of that is is missing and it's it's funny I, I i i i go around all over the outskirts of nairobi as well and, and people are still meeting people communicate and, and still come together but there's the official ways and the unofficial ways and how is digital able to help with that in a time of, of, of vast change across all the fa different fabrics uh, of, of life, um, you know, whether it's social government, church, whatever it is. All right, next slide. So I, I thought it'd be important to, to break down one important factor. There's, there's uh, when we think about connectivity and the internet, we generally think about this big bucket um, of connectivity. It's all, all in this one thing, but it's actually not. There's two parts to it. There's accessibility which is, do I have a, a device that can connect to the internet? And do I have a signal to connect to? That's, that's accessibility. And the other big bucket is affordability. And we don't talk a lot about that. Affordability is uh, maybe the most important part of it in Africa, though. We're seeing the signal is, is quite widespread. And we're seeing more and more people with smartphones or access to some kind of device, at least within a family group. Um, but they can't afford it. And so what they do is they use this as a media device. Uh, and the real numbers are on this is that of all the people who own smartphones in Africa, any country you go to, 20% uh, of them can connect to the internet regularly. 80% cannot. So they have the device, they have the signal, but they're still not connecting to it. So there's a problem there, right? And that problem is affordability. 
And really what we're trying to do is figure out how we can solve for that. So this is, this is really the problem we should be trying to look at across the continent. Because if you want to solve for all those last, kind of those last uh, pillars that we talked about, whether it's education or commerce, government services or healthcare, you cannot do that without affordable connectivity and, um, and people being able to, to do it as a, as, a, as a large population group. So slightly different than all that is something that I have to deal with as a leader of organization um, here. And that is um, in a crisis, your purpose really matters. So this is, so separate, this is a separate kind of speaking point than the last one, which is on connectivity and how that is the underlying undergirding issue today. The second one that is, I think a very interesting thing about as leaders is purpose. Um, in a crisis, purpose matters. It, you know, my organization, not everybody's a, a Christian, not everybody's a believer. Um, so what do you do when all around you is in disarray? You know, what do you do and why do you do it? And um, we have to communicate as an organization, as leaders in an organization about what it is with the purpose of the company. Why do we do the things we do? What's the mission? What's, and what, what allows somebody to wake up in the morning and say, this is worth doing? And the other part of it is as a person. What are we doing as a person and why does it matter? Um, you know, I think as, as Christians, we have uh, an added benefit here is that we know more that it goes beyond what our, our normal job is. Um, we, have, we have a purpose beyond that. And it, but not everybody does. And it provides a great opening for conversations and um, dialogue around what purpose means beyond making money, what purpose means beyond waking up and doing something for a job. Uh, and so I think that's an important part of dealing with crisis as a leader. And uh, that's all for me, thank you. Well, thanks so much, uh, Eric, we really appreciate that. I was trying to write down notes while I'm doing the moderator duty and I can tell that, uh, that your expertise is a true blessing uh, on the continent. We wanna thank you for taking the time to be uh, with us today. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from the Honorable Dr. Olivia Muchenna. Dr. Muchenna is the Zimbabwe former Minister of Higher Education and Tertiary Education Science and Technology Development. She's a passionate educator, and I appreciate that, uh, of the next generation of African leaders in the church, politics, government, and she brings over years of her experience with non-governmental uh, organization, NGOs, development work. Her 17-year academic career culminated in tenure as a senior lecturer of agricultural economics and extension at the University of Zimbabwe. Her governmental expertise includes a robust portfolio of service, uh, serving five consecutive terms as an MP and then uh, another six months as a senator. She is a mother, a grandmother, uh, also a passionate organic vegetable grower and a true kingdom asset as a minister and preacher in the United Methodist Church. So at this time, Dr. Machino, welcome, and we're so glad you're with us. You may proceed, ma'am. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the leadership of Africa and thank them for this tremendous opportunity to share ideas and strategies, as your letter of invitation said in our response is Christians to the pandemic, Christians who happen to be on the African continent. I just want to say by way of background, I'm going to speak mostly from my experiences in government and in the church and working with church organizations. I uh, entitled my presentation from crisis to new normal. And uh, I will be touching or relying a lot on the AU agenda 2063, aspirations, goals, and priority areas. But before we get to the slides, let me talk a little about the impact and uh, implications of COVID uh, with regard to education and the digital ecosystem. 
a crisis is viewed as uh, an event which leads to an unstable and dangerous situation. Uh, I came across uh, a definition of uh, hell on earth. I think in a way the COVID-19 fits into all those categories. I want to look at three broad uh, areas or of impacts. Disruption, disorder, and the disorientation, and how education and science um, and technology comes into this. With regard to the disruption that has taken place in the education system, we are experiencing an unprecedented period of uh, just waking up to a situation where children are not going to school, universities are not uh, operating as they should. Before you know it or you are ready for it, you did not prepare for it. That's a monumental disruption, uh, which creates a very high degree of uh, disorder in the lives, uh, of those affected children and uh, students at various levels of uh, education. Uh, on the ground, what this means is that uh, you need to find immediately ways of uh, dealing with that. And the immediate reaction has been uh, online education programs. And speaking within the uh, African context, that becomes uh, problematic in that depending on uh, where you are in the socioeconomic uh, uh, system or strata of society, we have a situation where the majority of children and university students may not be able or are not able to go online. I'm right now thinking of my former constituency, Mutoko South. Uh, yes, there are places which have been uh, electrified, rural electrification programs have uh, done a good job but not extensive enough to cover uh, every inch of that uh, constituency, for example. I am thinking of a university student who is coming from one of the remote parts of that place, who was just so fortunate that the poor parents were able to send them to university. They may not be able even to afford a, a laptop. It was relying on what was in the university library or something like that. I just want to highlight the disparities of uh, uh, situations when we talk about uh, online uh, education. In terms of uh, the the cost, for example, for those who are able to go online, the cost of data and uh, the lack of preparation or inadequate preparation uh, of even having the content uh, being delivered. This is just to give an idea of the enormity of the disruption and the disorientation that can uh, take place. Uh, as far as the technological system is concerned, when I was Minister of uh, Science and Technology, I, I was the inaugural Minister of Science and Technology. I had to set up a ministry and Africa at that time was going through the same process. So we actually had 
created an African Ministers of Science and Technology Council. And what was common to us when we met was the level of connectivity or penetration or a lack thereof. But more important, the lack of understanding of the importance, generally speaking, of science and technology in the wider population and uh, to a certain degree even within governments and government uh, leadership across the continent. So our primary, uh, or our priority area at that time was to build a consciousness and awareness of what it is that we were talking about. In fact, the people of Mutoko South uh, were almost very angry that I had been demoted to be given such a ministry which they didn't know what it meant. They were used to me being minister, deputy minister of agriculture, which was near their means of livelihood. But because of the, the programs we embarked on as ministers then, we felt Africa had a comparative advantage of a population which was predominantly young. If they could be given uh, education, access, if they could be penetration, Africa could be like a second India in terms of the digital ecosystem. How we progressed depended on each individual country, uh, the resources, the leadership, and so forth. Things have moved the somewhat, and we have a relatively much improved the situation. But what COVID-19 has done is to impose on this scenario that I have painted uh, requirements for government uh, to do things that uh, perhaps they were not uh, ready for or were going on gradually. So my question basically is, how do we move from a crisis situation to a new normal when you are not so endowed in terms of uh, infrastructure and as we heard from Eric, uh, power, energy demands being a uh, basics of that uh, movement. So I want to, to put that for discussion. We have a crisis situation, but we need to get out of a crisis management mode to a new normal while we are still in the crisis. Uh, here in Zimbabwe, our schools are going to reopen uh, about the end of July, and all efforts are being made to make uh, the situation uh, uh, not quite get back to normal, because uh, the children will not be going back to normal situations. And in the universities, some students have come back, those who are writing exams. The impact of COVID on that scenario is that uh, COVID uh, introduced uh, some psychological uh, parameters, if you like. One, that of disorientation. Two, fears. We are dealing with an unknown and even up to now not many things are known. We are dealing with a situation where our educational systems are designed for high degrees of interaction and all of a sudden we have uh, social distancing 
I often say to people, I prefer physical distancing than say social distancing because it creates in my so, mind uh, a, a social psychological aspect that uh, these people are now far from me when uh, in terms of relationship. So the kids will be going back to school. I'm sure they will be happy to be playing again. I don't know how they manage uh, social distancing on the playground. Uh, take that a little further up, the disruption that has taken place in our economies. I know the next webinar will deal about the economy, but I want to look at that disruption vis-a-vis -vis the digital uh, ecosystem. Developed countries or first world countries they did no problems with people immediately going to work at home online. But uh, for the majority of uh, African countries, where our economies have varying degrees of formal to informal sector dependence, that has been very, very disruptive, especially for the informal sector, which in some situations are quite critical to the economy. What this uh, says to me in terms of uh, uh, education is we need to now go to critically look at the if you like, uh, the, uh, the African Union Agenda 2063. Uh, and I would uh, urge participants on the webinar to go and look at that document. I cannot stop being amazed and inspired by the amount of work that went in, which resulted in uh, aspirations, goals, and priority areas being set for Africa, sector by sector or area by area. I have decided to zero in on a few that uh, affect the science, the, the education, science, technology, and innovation areas. Uh, for example, the first aspiration was is for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. And one of the key priority areas, there is a well-educated citizen, citizens and skills revolution underpinned by science, technology and innovation. So priority areas, there has been education, and STI skills driven revolution. There is on the AU website the first report of Agenda uh, 2063, which shows very significant progress that has been uh, made in this sector. But going back to the disruption element, governments or national states which are agreed to this um, agenda 2063 and perhaps were on a trajectory how are they responding now are they fast tracking are they reprioritizing uh, so that because of necessity africa now needs to go digital in an unprecedented uh, rate. But how do you determine those priorities when uh, at the point in time, it's a matter of literally life and death. So resources are being taken from other areas to, uh, to health, to social safety networks, net, Nets, it is very, very challenging to be a leader 
especially a leader in a government at this point in time. But those are the complexities that uh, the COVID-19 has brought about. I will not go through the, the other uh, slides or areas. I just want to touch in conclusion uh, the strategies I learned during my time in government that uh, it is very important to determine what your comparative advantage is in any given situation and also to determine what advantageous strategic positioning you might have as an individual, as an organization, or even as a country or continent. I just want to thank Afred for this uh, webinar because I believe Africa is very strategically positioned. There are things that governments cannot do now, but desperately need them. And that is have uh, information that is uh, based on uh, perhaps quick research efforts, based on um, models that can be tried. Uh, for example, in education, if we can't go back to normal classroom work, what small clusters of education can we have? In terms of digital, what is it that we need to have as Africa, as Africans right now, not tomorrow, in terms of educating people or making them aware of the importance of the digital ecosystem because it is affecting us and has the capacity of Africa being left behind as it were. Whereas we also have a comparative advantage. I still go back to a very young population who are the masters at this point in time of this digital ecosystem. There are amazing things happening all over Africa, but more happening at uh, an informal or non-formal, not recognized the potential, the capacity. And uh, I would urge Africa to look at some of those possibilities, what we need to do to get into the new digital ecosystem uh, determined world as it were. Uh, lastly, Af Africa as it's related to change. One of my uh, challenges during this uh, period, the lockdown period, was to look at uh, some of our local churches' response. Uh, we had, for example, different denominations quickly leading to the idea of sending messages all by one and a half hours, uh, complicated messages, totally oblivious of the cost of data, uh, the attention span, the availability of power to listen to that. And I said to myself, perhaps we need some experiments of educating uh, our church people, our church leaders, on how to communicate the word of God digitally in a short, sharp manner that can help sustain people as they are going through these uh, traumatic uh, experiences. And I saw that as another potential, another possibility of uh, Africa doing some pilot things uh, that can help the, the church in Africa. Because what I also sensed was that uh, perhaps we need a revision of this theological seminary training. 
how do we make the word of God real, practicable when we are in a crisis like this? How many people, for example, are experiencing the peace of God which passes all understanding in COVID related situations? I think uh, COVID has caused a, a shaking of everything, including the way we think, the way we do things. I would be very happy to engage in questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Machina. We've had a lot of questions in the chat room and continue to please um, put those questions in there. Some questions on the disruption of education and distance learning, and we can talk about that after we finish our session. So if you, again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in a chat room and then we will be addressing them. And you can also send them to everyone or send them privately. But Dr. Machina, thank you so much, Honorable Dr. Machina, for being with us today on this webinar. Uh, next, we have our next speaker, will be Mr. Tedros Tadasi. He's a noted social media thought leader in Ethiopia and also on the continent. Uh, Mr. Tadasi, welcome. And please go ahead and start. Let me see if we could uh, get the volume for uh Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, the athletic team, for having me here with you. And it's also good to see a, a good friend, Eric, uh, uh, and uh, some of you, uh, colleagues and friends. I'm so happy to see you here. Um, my name is David uh, Adesa Aya. I am from Ethiopia, from the Center for African Leadership Studies and uh, ex this. I am from an organization that's dedicated in leadership development, leadership empowerment, and uh, entrepreneurship development. Um, we have uh, been in the uh, business for the last eight years, and in this uh, eight years, we were able to serve uh, more than 20,000 leaders in uh, close to 15 different countries in the continent, in 85 organizations. And in all of the years, what we've uh, noticed uh, is, uh, especially now more than ever, uh, the need for leadership. So I'll be very brief about uh, COVID and its impact and uh, post-COVID life in Africa, because my colleagues uh, who spoke before me have uh, covered uh, what uh, the world is talking about. COVID uh, is an exposure. Uh, COVID is uh, a magnifier. It has showed us who we are and uh, it has showed us uh, the capabilities of our organizations, systems, and institutions. And uh, even uh, those who claim to be you know, strong and good enough uh, were exposed to be, uh, to fall short of their promises. So we say it, uh, COVID is an exposure. It showed us who we are and where we stand. And so when we see it this way, um, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, because we can always uh, learn and improve from the feedback. Um, I will be very brief and talk, uh, speak mainly on education. So we all know that this world is not going to be the same in its uh, post-COVID life, uh, meaning if there is at all one that's going to be called post-COVID. Um, so it's definitely going to be uh, uh, different and it's going to be highly, uh, like uh, uh, the speaker before me said, it's going to be highly disrupted and there will be uh, some disorders and disorientations. That's very true. Um, and it's going to be, for the most part, 
um, digitalized. Ethiopia, for instance, yesterday ratified its uh, 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 digital transition uh, code. So many countries are uh, drafting their codes. Things are going to change. Among the things that are highly uh, affected and disrupted, education is one. So uh, internet is not like Eric said, internet is not going to continue the way it is now. It's going to be improved. Uh, access to internet is not going to be a question in the world that we join, uh, whether we like it or not, or study or willingly, uh, willingly, we uh, join a world where access to internet is not going to be an issue, is not going to be a question. In fact, uh, I say I give it plus or minus three to five years, uh, otherwise internet, I don't even see it um, a commodity or a service to charge to be for the most part for free. Organizations are doing extensive research and experiment uh, for internet to be free. And they are changing their business models in a way that they would make their revenues from other uh, uh, form of revenues. So internet is going to be there. In fact, cheaper than we, we have ever imagined and probably for free in a way that nobody can stop it and it's going to be faster it's going to be accessible but the question then is especially for africa what are we going to do with it what content do we have the reason why organizations are coming up with from 3g to 4g from 4g to 5g is because they want to download things watch things and do things faster and in a shorter time. So if you see the question, it's a question of time and speed for more content. People with more content are craving for speed. We're having the speed. For example, uh, in Europe, we've been introduced to 4G way back. But the question is what are we doing with it? And how is it going to affect the education system is the question we need to answer. I only have a very brief recommendation for the education system and also a, a, a possible area for the church um, probably to influence educators and policy makers, uh, universities and colleges. I think and I strongly believe that our education system needs a paradigm shift or a change in mindset. For the longest time, we have been using a education system that has been there for centuries. That was, in fact, introduced in Europe, especially during the Industrial Revolution. It is old. It was meant to create people that can be hired for the industry. Those days are gone. So, in my view, the education system at least need, needs to bring a change in mindset at least in 10 major areas. One, it has to have a shift from managerial into entrepreneurial. We've been trying, we've been raising and graduating managers that are especially good in sustaining things. So the shift would help us raise uh, graduates that are entrepreneurial with good problem solving skill, skills, with better ownership of work and processes and institutions, with good resource mobilization and resource creation. So in general, a shift from managerial into entrepreneurial. The second shift should come or is highly recommended for it to be from good or best students, from a gold medalist into best or good teams. It is teams that can constantly solve problems, not good individuals. A shift from I into us, into we. From the best student into best teams. If we see COVID, the countries that have good uh, that that fault or that uh, flatten the curve are 
countries with good leadership where things flourish easily. And if you also notice the future, the future is going to be uh, highly in disruption, disorder, and disorientation. It is not individuals that usually have the solution or the answer, it is teams. So the education system needs to promote not individuals alone, but teams. From competition to collaboration. For the longest time, students compete in school. But I don't see that important. In fact, we don't even care if our students graduate as much as I want to see a lot of graduates in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia. I also crave to see students who, who want to drop out, who want to quit because they want to pursue their vision. They want to solve a problem because they want to pursue their passion. So not just competition, but also collaboration. The other is from classroom based into project based. This is what I might say that we need the education system to come up with from classroom to project. The other is from graduate into a learner. Most of our cultures, including in my own, in Ethiopia, there is too much emphasis on graduation and calling oneself as graduate of this and that. Hence, the graduate stops learning the moment he or she graduates. We mount our graduation picture in the living room and then we feed our parents and we stop learning. On the same day, we graduate from two schools, both from the university and from life. That should not be the case. In fact, graduation should be the day when we start learning. There should be an emphasis on learning ability. Our schools not graduating us graduates but learners the school system opening up the heart and minds of its graduates where whereby graduates will be more inspired to learn more to start learning the moment they graduate in those three four five six years the 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 the, 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 the students will be exposed to to tools that help them in becoming more self-aware in understanding the world, the social problems, different issues in the world, whereby they will rush to graduate and become learners and problem solvers. The eighth is from standard programs into customized programs. Why do I care about certain standards while I am in Addis Ababa place with a lot of challenges? Why don't we customize? Customize our education systems. From names and brands into customized education systems that solve problems, that help the graduates become entrepreneurial. From being right and perfect into making mistakes and failures. Schools should not be a place for our students to be right. It should be a place for our students to be wrong, to make mistakes, to fail, but fail fast and fail forward. Learn from it. We need to have schools where our students will be encouraged to make mistakes. That's the safest place. In life, the risk is high, the stake is high. People are not encouraged to make mistakes. Our universities and colleges have been promoting for the longest time brightness, perfection. So people would be tortured for trying new things because they want to look good, they want to look perfect. So our new system should encourage becoming and change becoming perfect into making mistakes and failure. And finally, from routines into habits. The college period should not be a random routine. It should be an intentional time for students to form new habits that help them uh, succeed in life. 
So these are a simple recommendation that we're teaching at the moment at the Center for African Leadership Studies for the, edu for the new education world. So if you see them useful for your uh, situation, for your circumstance, uh, feel free to take them forward. But if not, uh, you can leave them there. Uh, I would be willing uh, to accept any questions and comments, and I'd like to uh, respond on some of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Todros. I appreciate that. We have some questions that we'll hopefully be able to have some time to address at the end. Uh, finally, uh, today we have uh, the great privilege of hearing from the Apostle Apoku Oyina, a well-respected Christian leader who's the immediate past chairman of the Church of Pentecost with its headquarters in Ghana and 103 branches in other countries. He is currently a co-chair of the Scholars Consultation of Empower 21, He's involved in many of the ecumenical dialogues on the continent. He also lectures at the Pentecost University College in Accra, Ghana. In addition, he's a member of the Ghana National Peace Council. He's faithfully served as a full-time minister of the Church of Pentecost for over 42 years. And uh, though he has uh, officially retired as of 2018, he still lectures. <laughs> University. So it's my great privilege to uh, introduce to you all uh, Apostle Apoku to give us some reflections on what we've heard this morning. Apostle. Right. Thank you very much and good afternoon from Ghana here to all of you. Ghana here is afternoon. Yes, um, as he has already said, I'm just going to get in straight. I'm offering uh, some biblical and theological reflections on COVID-19, and then um, try to provide responses that we need from the churches. So what I'm going to do is to briefly uh, dig to what the Bible says about plagues, what the Old Testament says about it, what the New Testament said, and then deduce some theological reflections on them, and then out of that, find the church can respond. So, first, if you come to plagues in general, if you come to the Old Testament, is that plagues were initially plagues are associated with infectious diseases. But then, if you go to the Old Testament, you realize that it is associated with calamities and sufferings in general. That's what we can see from the Old Testament. That from that perspective, you can say that the flooding that took place in the time of Moses, a uh, time of Noah, can be associated with plagues. Then something like um, the, the farming that took place during uh, Joseph's time in Egypt can also be associated with plagues. And what makes plagues very common in the Bible um, are the plagues that took place in Egypt, when we wanted to deliver Israel from slavery. Now, if you examine the 10 plagues, you realize that nine out of the 10 took place in the land where the people of Egypt were living. Nine of them took place on their side. But then the 10th one took place in the whole land, including Gershon where the people of Israel were staying. So, for instance, when we take the first and nine into consideration, once you live on the side of the Egyptians, it will happen to you. But if you take the tenth one into consideration, that means it could also have, have happened to those people who were living in Geshem, with the exception that they obey what the Lord told them. In other words, the death aspect was to take place in the whole of the land. But the people of God were delivered because God had given instructions that they should apply blood on the doorpost. So it depended on two things, faith in what the Lord had said and obedience in the application of the blood. That tells us that at times plagues can take place and when plagues take place, it will affect 
all people who live on the land. Just as now it's affecting the whole of the world. Now you only have to be obedient to the instructions that have been given. God has been so generous to us that our scientists have been able to discover that at least by putting on uh, a mask, uh, nose masks, and then uh, application of water and um, uh, with soap and then um, uh, sanitizer, you could be protected. So once you are able to obey these things, it will help you. Now, if we jump, when the people of Israel left Egypt on the way to Canaan, they encountered something, and what they encountered was very important. When they went to Mara and they couldn't drink the water, and Lord had to instruct Moses to cut a, a tree and put it in the water. After he had done that, God spoke to them, and that is very important. And many uh, Pentecostal charismatics like that quotation from Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, which um, I can quickly read to you from the New International Version. It says, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So here, it would appear that the people of Israel were afraid that the diseases that they saw infected the Egyptians could also infest them. But God told them that if they would obey him, then he would not put the diseases on them because he is the Lord who heals. And this has become one of the powerful passages that Pentecostal charismatics take. But the Lord was telling them about obedience to his word. Now the obedience was taken up again when the Lord gave them the law. He laid emphasis that if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands that I give to you, then all these blessings will follow you. So blessings follow obedience. And then he continued that, on the other hand, if you disobey, then curses will follow you. And the curses lifted, uh, listed included infectious diseases, included calamities, draft, captivity, and all of these issues. So if you take the Old Testament into consideration, you realize that whenever there was a plague, wherever there was pandemic, wherever there was any disaster, disaster, the people associated it with disobedience to the Lord. That was very powerful when they went into captivity. They, they knew that they had sinned against their God. That is why uh, uh, the Lord allowed the enemy to take uh, control of them. And within the law was this um, uh, laws concerning Sabbath and the year of Jubilee, which was also very important. The Lord told them that if they failed to do that too, there would be captivity. And once the, law, the Lord allowed captivity to take place or the enemy to take control of them or any disaster to happen, what the Lord required from his people was complete repentance. Once the people repented and they sought the Lord, then the Lord was going to bring deliverance at his own time. So this concept was quite important in the, uh, in the Old Testament. Then if you come to the New Testament, you read that when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he hinted a bit about calamities, sufferings, uh, pandemic, and things of that nature. The first of these ones was the one, a question that was thrown to him by some people who saw that a tower had fallen on some people who had sinned. In fact, it began even with uh, uh, some people whom Pilate had killed as they were going to offer sacrifices to the Lord. And the Lord was saying that if you do not repent, similar things could happen to you. And then the Lord brought in the tower that fell on some people. And he said that if you do not repent, these things could happen to you. So it could be taken into consideration that once you are disobedient, something like that could happen to you. 
That was the issue. Now, again, when the was engaging with some Pharisees and some Sadducees, um, Sadducians, he mentioned something that was very important too. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to deliver you. I wanted to be protected. I wanted to save you from the hands of the enemies. But you could not allow me to do that. So I will leave you. But then if I leave you, calamities are going to follow you. Disasters are going to follow you. And you will desire to, to, to know the days the Lord visited you. He was rather saying that they had been obedient to the Lord because they had obedient to accept the baby, the deliverer, calamities were coming. Now, in this interaction too with the apostles, um, getting to the end of times, when the apostles wanted to know the signs of the time, he also brought famine that will come, and then he also brought uh, pestilence, in other words, plagues, infectious diseases that could also come during the, the last days. And he said that there will be sufferings. And even if the days were not short, when he, he related to the suffering that was coming to Jerusalem, if the days were not cut short, even the elect and those people who were around were all going to suffer. Which means that when calamities come, when pandemic comes, it can also affect people who are obedient and people who are the Lord's own. Now, so we can get these things from the Old Testament and from our Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to the apostles, um, what we hear from them or what we know from them is that they were rather responding to, um, let's say, disaster that had taken place. There was famine. And when there was famine, the people of God too were suffering together with all those people who were there, believers and non-believers. So they had to collect support for the people in Jerusalem. So they were responding to calamities. Now, if you want to draw some theological reflection from these biblical uh, uh, quotes that I've referred us to, you realize that they have some ontological implications. By that I mean the, the center on the question of existence. Whenever there is a pandemic, you realize that people begin to ask questions. What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? You are sometimes your very existence is questioned. You feel that it's not secure. Even when we relate it to COVID-19, are we going to die? Uh, are we going to wipe up from the earth? So the existence, the question of existence is there and our own security. Then we begin to ask ourselves whether even the Lord is in charge. Is, is the Lord in charge? Does he know what is happening? And when it comes to these things, he gives opportunity for Christians to come in and minister from various aspects because we know what is happening. Then it also brings some ecclesiological implications, implications that center on the church. How do we do church now? Are we doing church rightly? Is it just going to church in a building that that, that is very important to the Lord. So it questions our ecclesiology, how we do church itself. For some people, unless you have that large gathering, they wouldn't see God working. But is that what the Lord wants? And then it also brings in some missiological implications because missions and evangelism suffer a lot. We need money to send people out to support those people who are in missions. And when disaster happens, you see that missions is the first to suffer. Uh, because even the pastors who are ministering at home uh, sometimes find it difficult to get money. What about those people who want to send? So missions also suffer. And then sabbatical implications. Uh, is it that God wants the uh, sabbatical year for the world? We have been working the Lord without rest. What is God speaking to us? Is it like the year of Jubilee, where God wants even the space, our land, the sea, and everything to have some sort of rest? And ecological implications, we are disturbing the whole world, the forest, everything, the sea. So it's God saying that we have to hold on, give these things uh, some rest. And then finally on that side, uh, eschatological implications. Is it that the Lord is coming? 
It was when he was talking about end times, he brought in the sufferings, the earthquake, and all those things. How should I respond quickly? I realized that the church should trust that still the Lord is in control. The church should not panic. And the church should know that God works all things together for the good of those people that he has called. So God knows what is happening. It has not taken him by surprise. With all what is happening, he is still in control. And the church must take advantage of that and minister. And then African, for instance, should take advantage of this, manufacture our own thing, encourage uh, local entrepreneurs, and then try to try to do it ourselves at this time. So we should know that, the church should know that the Lord is in control and he can and is working everything for our good. Then if you feel that God wants us to rest, we have to reduce our programs. The church has become too much programized. Many, many programs. So we need time to rest, wait upon the Lord and hear from him. And then it's another way of God saying that we need to depend on him, trusting him to give us manna on daily basis, supplying our needs on daily basis. So total trust on the Lord is very important. And then we see that we need to strengthen the home church. Home church is very important. When God called Abraham, he said that I know that you'll be able to trade his household, teach them my word, instruct them of my word. So the church has been going out, ministry, making big gatherings and, and large meetings. God is saying that now gather your own people around you at home, just like the Passover, in to teach them what you know about me and what I have written about, about what has been written about me. So it's a time that the church needs to actually build the home church strengthen our children family life should strengthen uh, because the family life was completely getting out of the shoe and god says let us get back to the family and then finally we see that we might we have to make good use of modern technology the world has changed now uh, uh, ai artificial intelligence has taken control of everything but it seems the church is very slow in getting into it and the church was slow in getting into it. This is another way of God bringing attention to where the world is, uh, the world is heading towards. It. If we do not risk Christians who will be able to feed the data of AI, artificial intelligence with Christian language and evangelism, a time will come that we will lose all our ele uh, evangelical and Christian language in modern gadgets. So God is saying that the church should meet the challenges should interpret what is happening to the people and feel. And I think the church will need to consider these things, trusting, knowing that God is still in control, then asking the Lord, what is he speaking to me as an individual? What is he speaking to the church? What does he want us to do? And then try to meet these things with modern technology. God bless you. Thank you so much, also Onia. Thank you so much for what you're revealing to us again and sharing the foundation of faith that there is nothing new under the sun. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. And God bless you. Now, um, we want to be able to honor your time and we do have a short amount of time for questions. And so as we've been observing on the chat room, go ahead and write in your questions and we'll try to um, at least have the presenters be able to answer them. But uh, Dr. Um, Honorable Dr. Marcina, we would like for um, you to answer a question that we have on um, just homeschooling. How do we, um, as a result of the COVID-19, how do we respond with the need for homeschooling and the type of um, materials that they need to function to be able to do that? And especially the um, discussion of the lack of technology um, with going on with the students right now. What would you say to the homeschooling question and also just the question of uh, continuing education? Uh, thank you. I hope I got the question uh, correctly. How do we deal with uh, Christian education material or what? Sorry. Um, 
two part question. The first one was, um, someone wrote about the homeschooling, the difficulty of homeschooling, the lack of resources that, that were required to be able to homeschool their particular children. And then in cause of the COVID-19 um, and the lack of technology, just the effect of um, COVID-19 on the education system, whether they were homeschooling or continuing the formal education at home. Okay. Okay, let me try to respond. I think I have some technical glitch. Uh, in terms of uh, homeschooling, we have seen uh, a number of people uh, go for homeschooling, but the issues are always, do we have curriculum? I think that's one area of priority that needs to be undertaken. I'm not quite sure at this point in time, but there are aspects that are government related. We could have governments look at different delivery systems and how to uh, cut their cloth according to a particular delivery system. So a curriculum for homeschooling would be very different in some ways from uh, our usual open system. Again, that could be uh, a civil society, church-related organization project. Uh, look at homeschooling, how it can be organized to be effective. But uh, since we deal with the certifications and stuff, we'll need them to relate to, uh, to government uh, side. Uh, the other question, I still don't get it, sorry. I did not get it. Thank you, Dr. Chair. We'll try to pass that on to you uh, via the chat function. Uh, we did have another question, and I'll direct this toward uh, Mr. Hersman. So Eric, if, uh, if they can bring you online. One of the questions that we had was, uh, talked about uh, empowering leaders today. And how can we empower leaders leaders in the marketplace, leaders at the church, what skills in the digital environment should they be seeking out so that they could navigate the changing innovative area that they're dealing with? So I'll direct that at, uh, at Mr. Hersman first. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. And I think maybe Teddy's is as good of a person to answer that as I. Um, so I think you need to just be able to embrace the different tools that are in front of you. Um, you know, we are, you already, everybody here already has a smartphone, I'm guessing. Um, uh, many here will have a computer. So being able to just be, first of all, know what that device can do. Uh, don't be scared of it. Um, the second thing is, and understand where your, where, where the people who you're trying to communicate with are and what are they using? Don't go and create something new, meet them where they are. So if they're on WhatsApp, then use WhatsApp. Um, if you're gonna do a sermon and you're gonna put it up on YouTube, you have to understand the data costs for YouTube are very high. But if you do an audio sermon, you can do a 20 minute audio sermon and put it out on, on, um, in a file on WhatsApp to hundreds or thousands of people. And then that can be shared around. Those are the simple mechanisms that you need to use instead of thinking really like there's a complicated um, algorithm or formula that you need to follow. Look at what people have, look what they're already using, and then use the same tools to communicate with them because they're already using those same tools to communicate with everybody else. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you had kind of directed, so I'll ask if we can unmute uh, Teddy because we're talking about innovation. And we have a question, uh, Tuadros, that we think uh, you can feel to follow on with what Eric just said. So Tuadros, I'll ask you uh, one of the questions that uh, our attendees asked is you had mentioned the internet that we have today is not going to be the internet we have tomorrow. So uh, in lieu of that, how do, uh, how do we tap into the young people and their familiarity with the digital environment? And how do we leverage these young leaders 
to take their innovative capacity and maybe help uh, those of us who are dealing with legacy issues. So how do we bring in the young people and their innovative capacity into the space so that their innovation can be used, if not in the church, in the marketplace, and the likewise? Um, sorry, uh, can, you, can you say the question again? You were breaking a little bit. Yes. Uh, how do we bring young people and their innovative capability into leadership positions? Hmm. Um, so bringing the young leaders into positions uh, is not, you know, uh, an easy task uh, or uh, it's not just a one-way uh, solution. It requires um, the willingness, the capabilities, the abilities, and the working together of both the new and the one in position. So it is an environment. Basically, it's an environment. So also, you know, young people, especially the new generation, they need to be willing to serve uh, those uh, that are in position. Um, people, you know, uh, young people come to our office, uh, people, young people they, who don't even know us, and they would come and say, um, uh, I want to become like you, and teach me how you do what you do. And none of them are willing to understand and see what I do today uh, have taken me 20 years. It is not something very easy that, you know, I can easily give it away. Uh, even if I want to, I can't. So basically, uh, coming into leadership position is a relationship. So young people should have the character competencies uh, that would help them uh, assume those positions. The other is also, you know, people in leadership position, they should also mentor others, young people, especially young leaders, emerging leaders. There should also be a constant and continuous leadership development program, especially within the church and outside, in private business or government institutions and all that. There should be identification of talent, hiring new talents, developing talents. It's a process. It's not an event, you know, that just happens, boom, at a go. It doesn't. If you see in the Bible for Elijah to take Elisha to take the position of Elijah, it has taken him years. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we so have it is a process and environment, but it requires intentionality on both sides. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I want to direct this at uh, Apostle Oniya. Uh, this was a, a question from Zimbabwe, and they were asking, uh, Apostle, what practical tools do pastors and church leaders need to develop now to sustain the church and move the church to where the Lord wants them to be in terms of ministering to families, outreach, uh, generating finances? What are the tools or skills pastors are going to need to acquire in this new time. Yeah, thank you very much. I think now pastors and lay um, leaders need to know how to use the modern gadget to meet the people where they are. Uh, as we heard, of the many people are using WhatsApp, they are using Facebook, and they are using all of these things. So pastors should learn, acquire quickly, how effective we can use this equipment and then reach the people where. And I think that if you are able to reach them, minister on, on uh, virtual churches and minister to where they are, they, they will respond. In fact, one pastor told me that, well, he lives in the world, but he told me that when COVID-19 started and there was lockdown, he, he has had many people coming to virtual church more than they were attending the physical one and then he has got money in his church more than he was getting that means he's meeting the people at where they are so we should be very flexible and then quickly acquire knowledge of ministry on the virtual church once we are able to do that and the people are fed then they'll begin also to even supply our needs through such means thank you, thank you so much uh, uh, apostle we appreciate that now, we do want to be uh, both sensitive to everyone's time, 
but also we don't want to cut off the, uh, the ongoing discussion. So uh, what we would like to do is uh, we're going to give some time for some informal back and forth between our panelists. But uh, for those that did have to uh, leave, we do want to take this time to provide some information before we have an informal time of interaction if our, uh, if our panelists can stay. So uh, before we get to our informal time, we did want to take this opportunity on behalf of our AFREG president, Bishop Nguiza Nkandla, our chairman, Professor Deliano Adodova, our, who is also serves as a global vice president with Campus Crusade for Christ International, as well as all of our distinguished panelists today. We want to thank you for being a part of this important conversation on COVID-19 and its impact on education as well as the digital environment in Africa. And we've had some very, very uh, thoughtful ideas for all of us to consider. So thank you all very much for that. And before we leave, we'd like to direct your attention to the website, the afreg.org website. You can get more information on the panelists you are also able to get a, a recording of our first webinar that we had last week. And we also have two additional webinars. Next week, we'll be talking on business, um, economics, and labor. And then on July 1st, we'll have our final series dealing with the topic of vision for a new Africa post-COVID-19 as an opportunity. Please also go to the website. We have a united prayer effort and you'll be able to see on the website uh, just different opportunities for you to be able to pray in unity on what is going on. Again, thank you for being with us. Thank you for just supporting us um, as we have been walking through the translation. We do want to thank our translator. Thank you so much for being with us to help uh, just provide additional information for everyone. And again, as you see the slides, it has the website and then the upcoming webinars itself. So on behalf of our um, AFRAG board men, member and our webinar coordinator, Dr. Uh, Setri Naomi, we thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we are going to close the formal portion of our webinar. And we're gonna ask Apostle if you can just close us in prayer. And then after we have the closing prayer, for those who would like to remain on so that you can talk to the panelists, please feel free to do that. But we want to honor your time and then to close in prayer. Apostle, if you can go ahead, please. If we could unmute Apostle Apoku, please. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity given to us to meet at this level, discussing and finding ways that we can know you well and also do your will on earth here. We pray, we pray that you bless all the efforts that you've made and where even it was not clear, we pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our minds and thinking so that we'll be able to understand what you are trying to communicate to us in order for us to do what you want us to do and in order for your kingdom to grow here on earth, as even it is in heaven. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you all so much. Please feel free to uh, converse with one another via the chat function or address questions to our panelists as long as they can stay on, probably for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you all so much for all that you've done, uh, and we appreciate you. God bless you. Okay, so what we'll do at this point, if there's any additional uh, questions, Diana, if you could send those to them and we'll direct those at our panelists uh, for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Or you can raise your hands to speak and uh, we'll see if we can orchestrate that. Yeah, I think I've sent all the questions to the panelists already or raised them in the chat for everybody to see. So I will continue to do that. Uh, while we're waiting, um, Todros, are you still uh, on? If you could unmute. Uh, 
Uh, Todros, if you're uh, if you're available, one of the questions was asked. I think Eric had asked if you could share about XHub in Avis and how you're using that uh, uh, to advance what you all are doing. AD is not online. Okay. There was a question from Samson to Dr. Muchena on uh, government, the role of government in providing uh, IT and internet connectivity, those kinds of infrastructure. And the question is whether or not in the case of uh, Zimbabwe, from her experience, it was lack of knowledge or bad leadership that these things have not taken place in Zimbabwe. So if Dr. Muchena is still on, she could respond to Samson from Ghana. Yes, I'm still on. Um, I would say um, there was a time when um, the continental uh, project was going uh, on about uh, being connected. I'm not sure how I say this, but uh, I think a lot of uh, politics and maybe partly ignorance went into it. I say politics because uh, there was a time when we felt under siege, as it were, and maybe everything that we were not um, familiar or comfortable with, we saw is uh, threatening. Uh, this was a question from Leona Okay, we'll try one more time. It's on Hello. the homeschooling to all of the panelists. It's along the uh, lines of the apostles' comments to look beyond traditional uh, uh, and modern schooling to what God is opening up our children to, encouraging children and adults to discuss how is it? What type of conversations should we be having about institutions and how we adapt with what's going on in the digital environment how we pray, how we go to church and the like, how that's changing what we would consider the old normal to the new normal. So I'll open that up to any of our panelists. And that is basically how do we disciple our children in these particular areas? Um, all right, let me, <clears throat> let me share some of the things that we do. Um, Sometimes we, we, we listen to a message on Sunday and uh, we begin the church with them for one hour, one and a half hours. Then after that, um, we pray and end it. Then I'll tell them the following day that we are going to discuss what we had, what we had. So the following, we meet on uh, uh, Monday evenings too. So Monday evening, we will share, uh, each one of them will bring out what he picked from the sermon that was preached or from the service that was we, we, we attended the following day. And by that, you have the opportunity to explain things to them, what they didn't understand. If someone has a question, the person can bring it. So that brings interaction. Then it makes us more involved in the service that took place on the the. Uh, uh, virtual service, yes, let me put it that way. So that is a practical one from my end. Somebody can bring in some hands. Would someone else like to comment on uh, the aspect of uh, training up our children to operate in this new environment? Yeah, I think training them is involved here. 
um, because when it comes to prayer, then you, you have the opportunity to pray with them. And here also, the other aspect of being with them, listening. So if, for instance, you have a service at nine, then all of you get involved. So you are with them, they listen to it. Unfortunately, the virtual services are not too long. So you'll be able to hold, uh, 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 hold the service with them either one hour or one and a half hours. And then after that, I don't, want, I don't allow us to discuss it immediately, thinking that maybe they may be tired or something of that nature. And then pick it on the next time that we meet, if we meet on Monday. So if you want to do yours, for instance, on Wednesday, you, have, you should have a specific time that becomes the family altar. If it is twice or thrice, uh, then you meet on that day and then you discuss what you've heard. Other times too, you too should minister and then you should allow some of the family members, your wife, the children. Uh, sometimes we have a, 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 a roster. Maybe you lead a prayer service today and then someone will bring the message. So we have shared it. The day that we share what we had and the day that you allow a family member also to share. Thank you, Apostle. Now, I did have one question that, uh, well, I'll direct this at, uh, at Mr. Hersman. So, Eric, if you can unmute. This was a question that was kind of been asked in a number of our webinars, and that is, uh, we'll follow up. How are individuals to get the best information? What are the best resources available if they're going to navigate in the educational digital space? Where can they go to get the information, best practices, uh, best tools uh, to enable them to do this? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I know. So, yeah, I mean, that really needs an education expert more than yeah. myself. And it, it's also, also because it's a relative answer, depending on some of it's a relative answer, depending on where you are, because the best French resources are very different than the best English resources, uh, things like that. Um, we've like for East Africa, for Kenya, we've compiled a, a grouping of education resources for primary, secondary, tertiary, and continuing education. Um, and we broadcast that out to the two million people that we cover with connectivity, uh, so they can have access to it and see and see what those tools are. Those those are largely created by other people, right? They're they're different um, groupings of educational content, of training content, things like that, that are made available. But I would what I would I would pose to you is that it's very if not Kenya specific, at least East Africa specific, and it won't have the same relevancy. Um, to some of the other people on this on this call, I can I am happy to share that link with you as well. Okay, thank you so much, Eric. We uh, we appreciate that. Um, Dr. Machina, are you still on the line? Because um, would you like to add something else to that question of resources available? Okay, she may have dropped off. Okay, Diana, do you have any additional questions that uh, that we can direct to our panelists? Teddy is back, if he can answer the previous question. Uh, are you uh, yes. are you with us? One question that was forwarded to me is what XHub Addis does. So uh, to say it again, uh, Exhub Addis was started in 2014 as an initiative of the Center for African Leadership Studies, which is our leadership development organization. We started the leadership firm in 2012, and after two years, we wanted to give back to our community. And when we give, we wanted to give the best to our community. And for us, the best is human beings uh, that uh, we can give. So we said, why don't we raise leaders and entrepreneurs uh, who would solve the problems that the city faces? So, and we said, okay, how do we give that uh, back to the community? We said, let's raise, uh, we did a survey, a research, and then we came up with a solution. 
uh, that would uh, uh, satisfy both our, uh, our desire and also that would, that, that would uh, help the city. So we decided to raise uh, IT entrepreneurs. So we started out as an IT entrepreneur uh, in incubation space center. So then we had a cold feet, you know, whether to launch it and uh, to start it. And we were not sure. Uh, nobody knew that we would have such a huge impact. Then uh, Meheret and his colleagues were uh, running a program called Indigitus and Eric was invited as a speaker there and then we met with Eric and then the encouragement from brothers and friends uh, gave us a huge leap. And in 2014, we officially started the ex as an IT uh, business incubation space. Then two years down the road, we were able to raise some few entrepreneurs, one, a group of three, a group of four, a group of seven, a group of five. And then we were successful with these people. Then we decided how about we open up our doors to all entrepreneurs that are up to uh, solving social problems. Then in 2016, we decided to be a social uh, entrepreneurship center, business incubation space. Uh, then since then, we were able to raise a lot of social entrepreneurs that are solving actual existing problems with a strong emphasis for IT. So since then, we've been working with big organizations like uh, the British Council, Mastercard Foundation, um, and many others, including government agencies and offices. Uh, through all of this, we were able to solve um, actual problems that are on the ground in education, in transportation, in agriculture and food, uh, in uh, other areas. So all this was started as, as a way of giving back, but now it's entirely changed our philosophy of leadership. Um, then we discovered that in our leadership uh, development, there is too much emphasis on power leadership, positional leadership. In Africa, there is too much emphasis to approach leadership from a position perspective. But leadership primarily is a role and not a position. So. Uh, we came up with a unique philosophy after serving for seven years uh, and taking the two missions, leadership and entrepreneurship. Then we came up with a unique uh, formula, which is leadership plus entrepreneurship is equals to social transformation, meaning uh, we did a lot of surveys and we saw organizations where, and where leaders took themselves as uh, entrepreneurs and where entrepreneurs saw themselves as leaders, we saw magics happening, social transformation happening, institutional organizational transformation happening. So since then we designed unique programs called entrepreneurial leadership. We taught it in many government offices, in schools, in agencies, and we encourage leaders to be entrepreneurial. And also for entrepreneurs, we encourage them to, to see themselves as leaders. So when entrepreneurs take themselves as leaders and when leaders are entrepreneurial, miracles happen. So uh, we have a unique philosophy of blending leadership and entrepreneurship together. Uh, all this you can see from our website, www.exhabadis.com and www.mycats. CALS means Center for African Leadership Studies, mycals.net. Thank you. Excellent. Dr. Mutino, we very much apologize that we're having some audio. What I think would be better at this time is for uh, Della, did you have something before we sign off? So uh, if you could unmute Professor Della. So I think that we have had good conversation uh, on the subject. And uh, I, I like for us to end on the note that uh, COVID is uh, it's an interruption, but it is also an accelerator. And we should look at it more positively and ask ourselves, how do we capitalize on COVID-19 as an accelerator to, as it were, modernize and increase the effectiveness of our education and our communication and our ability to lead 
by utilizing artificial intelligence. And uh, we should be preparing for a new normal so that post COVID, we are using the, the skills gained from the COVID era for a more effective and relevant and impactful and transformative Africa. Thank you, Professor Dello. For, at this time, we're going to unfortunately have to uh, end our webinar. We'll remind everyone we'll have two more in the following Wednesdays. Please direct your attention to the AFREG website uh, at afreg.org. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being with us, for all of our panelists and our leaders. Yeah!